Hello, and welcome to a Bon Mott's production of Masterpiece Theatre, where we review critically acclaimed cinema spanning the breadth of human filmmaking. Masterpiece Theatre. Spoilers, mature content, inappropriate language. Join us. Masterpiece Theatre. Hello and welcome back to Masterpiece Theater for a special Halloween edition as we review Silence of the Lambs, which is number 74, was mm-hmm. it, on the AFI 100 list. A friend I'm having for dinner, Stephen Ramosi. Hello. And taking his, a break from making his human suit, Scott Thurlow. I pair very well with a glass of Chianti. Yes. Good evening. So today we're, again, doing Silence of the Lambs. Uh, I will give the funny lock line here. Silence of the Lambs is a Great rom-com between a fledgling FBI agent and her the charming, misunderstood psychiatric <laughs> serial killer. It is adorable and wonderful and beats Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan any day. <laughs> sure, and so, very heartwarming. Yeah, so, yes. Scott, to the actual synopsis. So, it's somewhat like that. So, as you said, a fledgling FBI agent in training, more, more or less a student, is assigned by her superior to uh, basically interview a well-renowned, if not the most renowned, and infamous serial killer to possibly uh, solicit his help on a case that they're tracing for another killer who's running amok and uh, they they can't seem to solve it. And she builds a rapport with him and eventually uses him, he uses her to solve the case and she tracks on the killer and wraps it all up. Okay, well, we'll dive right in with the introduction which I will give. You're introduced to Clarice Starling, played by... I'm blanking. What's Jody her? Foster. Jody Foster. Jody Foster, who uh, she's a young woman who is training to become an FBI agent. You're witnessing her kind of, in a sense, it's almost like a college school type, uh, like feel yeah, to it, a little bit, but with like the FBI Quantico uh, mm. version of that. But like, mm. she's wandering through the whole hall, saying hi to like fellow students, <laughs> doing her like running and training, and she gets assigned to. Under a false pretense uh, by Jack Crawford, who is uh, an FBI, a full FBI agent, to go interview um, Hannibal Lecter, who is the ha- famous Hannibal the Cannibal, and it kind of the idea of g- getting a profile on him. But Jack Crawford knows that Hannibal Lecter will be interested in profiling uh, the notorious serial killer that is currently going on, Buffalo Bill. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have that kind of rapport. They. I wouldn't say become friends at first, but they have Mutually mutual respect. respect. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and eventually, a Hannibal Lecter sends her on a task to find a one of the, the like a victim of Buffalo Bill Pryor. I I believe that like, it's actually that's kind of an un, not an unclear thing because the uh, the moth in the throat yeah appears in both victims, but nonetheless, it's a clue and. Eventually, Buffalo Bill ends up kidnapping a senator's daughter, and I would think that is the start of the body, and the, like that kidnapping is the impetus yes. for the rest of the story. That sets up yeah. the body, and that's, uh, I agree with that. That's right, where you are introduced to him, he's kidnapping a young woman who's just come home, and he stuffs her into his van. <laughs> oh, he tricks her into it first, right. of course. Well, he tricks her to help right. him carry his There's some love uh, seat. subterfuge involved, if you will. Or, sure. uh, you know chair he gets to move and then love seats. <laughs> shoves her into the back beats her up and uh drives away mm. so i really like the tone they set initially with the film it's i've seen this movie 10 times or so i i adore this so my bias i'm gonna try to sure. hold back on my bias it was fortuitous that we happened to choose this one uh, or we did just because it happened to be on the best or afi and that uh, Ian very much enjoys it. And I also like it a lot, well, sure. And it is October. Yes. And as we all know, course. October is the spookiest month. And yeah. this is somewhat of a psychological horror sure. thriller. Movie. I would say it's more in like the thriller range. Yeah. Comparable I mean, to I agree. a number of like Along Came a Spider. Or right. A, and to the more of like the horror, where that bridge between thrill and horror comes is really seven. Mm, which kind yeah. of falls more into the horror. This is more of the thriller angle, but still it's has still got, horror elements to it. It's still got that gore 
feel to it. Yeah, at, I think at points, it, though, I think it balances the line uh, quite well between both of those. I think you can slap sort of both those labels yeah. if you will onto it, but it handles them both quite well. I think like the initial font. I think we all uh, we, again remember you, you remember the details of movies you love over and over again, but you don't remember all the little specific mm, elements to sure. it. So it it felt older. It felt like a '90s movie, early '90s, and but that was the date Which this was made. It is, but sure. yeah, and the font really reflected that, and the foggy atmosphere of her running through the forests of uh, Quantico mm. uh, and Virginia, and. I think like it really establishes the plot well. The characters are very gripping. You're very interested. Like, and again, Anthony Hopkins steals every scene. Sure, he's mm-hmm. We'll speak upon that. Yeah. Uh, but of course, I agree that yeah, it's a great setup, as you said, sort of psychological, sort of crime thriller drama, sort of like Dexter before Dexter even existed. Where yeah, you get you get introduced to the characters, the you know the, the law enforcement side of it, who, and then you meet the um, of course uh, the the creepy killer. Or, uh, the consigliere of serial killers, <laughs> if if you will, and uh, and then you see the the, the initial like uh, the Buffalo Bill. This is a fourth or fifth victim that you actually see on screen. Yeah, the yeah. first one you see uh, on screen is yeah, that. I think, I think the I the, the newspaper said fifth in, yeah, victim said Buffalo right or a Bill to claim skins fifth victim or whatever. Yeah. So then you actually see his next victim, and boom! I think it all sets it up perfectly nicely, perfectly paced, uh, introducing you to the world and. I think you would be very invested into it. I certainly was. Mm-hmm. And again, like, like I haven't seen it as many times as E, but I've seen it a number of times, just not as recently. But seeing again, sort of fresh, if you will. Yeah, it's an engaging, um, you know, yeah. it gets you invested into the a whole story that's about to unfold. Absolutely. And having seen it as many times as I have, I'm still very Riveted. invested. Yeah, and sure. Like, this... I think I always thought that this movie was like two and a half hours towards three hours. It's exactly two, really. Yeah, and they really tend to shove a lot of detail information, and like the pace is actually very quick throughout this mm. entire thing. Yeah, so it's not a thriller that dwells on like it dwells appropriately, but it never over a scene never overstays its welcome. I'll agree, and I'll just I'll just say this: not a single second in this film is wasted. Is is like could, could have been cut out. I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I thinking back on it, I I agree with that as well. So um, I'm gonna give it a strong ass one. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a one for intro. I, thought, I agree. I thought it did a really good job introducing, and y- you know, you get every character that's important except for Chilton, I guess. In that, in nah, that he's beginning. still there. No, Is because he... uh, in the introduction. Oh yeah, that's right. That's no. right. Yeah, yep. yeah. You meet you meet him as she as Clarice goes in yep. to. Uh, that's right. So yeah, you get every character. You get all of their intros, and exactly does a really good job. So, Steve, it's on to you with the body. All right. Once uh, Buffalo Bill gets the senator's daughter into his van, you kind of start going into Clarice trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, I'm going to maybe gloss over a few points and we can come back to those, but you get Clarice figuring out kind of more and more like getting into uh, Lecter's mindset you see that developing slowly she starts figuring out that he's just leaving her clues and kind of figuring those out as she goes and visits him more every time that she comes up with something different and wants to talk to him again uh, you get that development a little bit at the same time you kind of see a little bit about Bill you don't see all that Buffalo Bill you don't see all that much about it it's just kind of it's just kind of him being a strange guy and you start to get a little bit of his uh weird uh, picadillos uh, like you know his like strange little things it, it, it's not toward it's not until towards the end i don't remember if it's after the cutoff point of the conclusion where it, the famous scene of him like it's dancing right around. before that i think yeah okay so like you know in in the body you also have that scene of and if you've ever seen signs of the lambs you know exactly what scene i'm talking well, about even if you haven't you probably have heard of it from osmosis but yeah, but a lot of this movie is just conversations, like slow conversations that are developing the plot. Um, there's also the scene where Lecter breaks out, which is really cool, and you actually kind of get that action and that. Well, it's sort of on the cusp of like, where we break gore. up the body conclusion, but sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That, that's just some like main points for me. I don't want to go on too long. You can talk about the body of this thing forever, but like, are there any other points that you guys want to bring up, like specific so scenes I, or anything? What uh, again? I watched I watched this all throughout high school, and I 
uh, where I became a huge fan during that period. I read the all of the books of Sinner for Hannibal Rising, which I pretend not to. <laughs> that doesn't exist. Ignoring it. Regardless, yes. there's an interesting aspect to Hannibal Lecter's personality and his interaction with Clarice Starling mm. that I kind of, upon this viewing, realized that I always adored the character of Hannibal Lecter for the fact that, like, his... He's one of your favorite hero villains, yeah, if, if you will. His cultured appearance and his intellect. But then I realized that he knew that he wasn't he wasn't Sherlock Holmesing it. He wasn't figuring this out. He knew all the answers. He was just bored and playing a game, which in a way works on one level for his character that I still really admire. But on another, it sort of it diminishes that diminishes, aspect. Yeah. yeah, because again, I wanted he's not he's incredibly intelligent, but he's not as like like he, he, the thing is he's teaching uh clarice starling to use logic to solve these mm. crimes but all the while knowing the answer yeah. of what the puzzle was sure so there's a that element that was uh, and the fact is clarice like hamletter almost has to spell it out for clarice mm -hmm. at the end which another thing i didn't like i was so engrossed in the charisma that i perhaps wondering if i always thought this movie was more intelligent perhaps than it actually you yourself was. were seduced by hannibal lecter yes i i mean <laughs> but i don't think that detracts from the quality no i mean agree it's funny I, I see what you're saying and maybe you're right like maybe we noticed it or happened to point it out upon this viewing after having seen it a number of times throughout our lives but i i I don't know if it detracts as much as you seem to think it does. But I don't I get think it, it though. does. I see what you're saying. Like it's as if like you thought it was more cool, more awesome, more um, ca in character if he was figuring out with her versus oh, I knew the answer all along and just sort of like doing it because I have nothing else to do. I'm but upon like in, um... in retrospect, sure, I, I I completely understand. But I I think it's sort of like not a moot point, but you can take it both ways. And even if we take it the way we just said. I still think it's effective, and it still carried the body through. Yeah, and the performances in this yeah. sell whatever yeah. flaws in the narrative. Of Absolutely, that yep. I may be able to nitpick out of this. <laughs> so I'm giving it a strong one uh, overall. I think. And yep, me too. The very the very end of the body is his escape scene, which I think is yes, the it's a good cut most point. famous yeah. scene. Like from I don't this know if movie. it's the most famous, but of course, like I see what said it's it. Like you're waiting for the gruesomeness to happen, and there it is. Yeah, and it, you yeah. know, it, I and I think that stringing that along the entire film is really effective in making that scene have a lot more punch. Of course, to it because if you were, it was happening the whole time, it wouldn't be as yeah, effective. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that that's where yeah, you know, when uh, when Lecter pulls the cop's face off, and you know proceeds to kill the entire ambulance. You don't even need to see him kill the entire ambulance. Sure. You know, you know, yeah, that's all you need. No, I agree. Honestly, you don't see anybody's death on camera, right? That he kills. The only thing that you the the closest you get to seeing anybody's death is when he's beating the guy with the uh, with his own baton, nightstick. yeah, with the billy club. But it's on his face, but, and not that guy. But it's body. showing yeah. Lecter. It's not showing right. the the cop getting beaten. I, th I think uh, Jamie Gump is the only character you actually see die on screen. Uh, Buffalo uh, Bill, uh, that is. Uh, uh, yeah, um, Buffalo Bill. Yeah. Uh, but I th yeah, I think that everything you see is the aftermath or from a different perspective. Sure. You don't see the murder at, like a as it happens. As and it even were. even with Buffalo Bill, if you remember, all you see is her pointing the gun and shooting it from his point of view. And then yeah. you see him and laid out. And no, like, he falls back you, against the You do like, see him, like quote unquote, second. die on screen, but you don't see him get shot. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, again, that's nitpicky. But like like I said, like uh, I mean, I think it comes up by here. Again, there was not a single wasted second of screen time for anything yeah. in this film. And the body, like it's like you said, it's funny as, as we mentioned e, that we had both thought this was a longer film, but nope, it's pretty much exactly two hours. In fact, the one fifty nine. If we're gonna get really technical about it, yeah. but regardless, it's perfectly paced. Absolutely, everything is parsed out when it needs to be, how it needs to be. You start, like, you know, following these characters and their worlds and their so uh, interactions with each other it's perfect i have to give it a one and yeah i'm agreeing with that i'm going to give it a one too it's all that really good tension building mm -hmm. that eventually explodes and that is such a like that's such a perfect moment of you know violent explosion at the end there 
pays off all that tension building yep. that they've been doing on Absolutely. the entire movie. All right, this one last point I want to make about the, uh, this movie in general. Narrative-wise, if I broke down to you what the plot of this movie is, there's nothing particularly special about it. It could be a James Patterson novel in, yeah, yeah. The, in the way, but like just the yeah, framework. Right. I mean, it's it's of funny what something you said precast, but yeah. I, I'm, I know what you're saying, and I agree with what you're about to, I think, but, lay out. But and I we'll get into this heavy in characters. It's really the char- oh, every single one of the characters that sells this movie, mm-hmm. yeah, and their interactions. As you mentioned, uh, Zubo, it's all about conversation, and that this what like. This movie and the book itself, too. It turns upon that and does it extremely well. The character development is perfect. And I'm going to give it a one, not necessarily for the narrative, but because of how the characters interact Mm -hmm. with that The characters propel the narrative, and I think that serves a one. Okay, so Scott, on to a conclusion with you. All right, so as we just said, sort of of two concurrent things. Um, Hannibal's uh, breakout from, so they move him, like, as part of the plot, he sort of fools them into, like, uh, releasing some information. He, uh, as you said, he he knows who the killer is, and he sort of like plays a game with them. So they move him to like a less secure area, in which he uh, exploits to break out, um, off like on sl- quote on and not off screen mur- murders mm-hmm. the, the two guard the two uh, sergeants who are guarding him, and then escapes. And then at the same time, uh, he or right right before that he hands Clarice the uh, case file back, which contains like the clues. He essentially says like his cryptic cannibal like everything you know catch him is already there. Yeah. So she uh, finally, like, sort of does a bit of detective work in her house and figures out where to go, or at least f- finds the next lead, which leads her to a house who she thinks is an old lady's house, but actually is inhabited by, of course, Buffalo Bill. And she instantly, like, based on her interactions with him in the first, like, 10 minutes or so, like, looking at his, uh, you know, body motions and so forth and, like, what he's saying to her, she knows it's him. She knows he's the killer. And then, like, it sort of switches back and forth between that. Well, she also sees the uh, moths. Sure. Like, again, like, yeah, there are various clues around the house and which she instantly puts together very quickly, at least, that she's indeed in the house of Buffalo Bill. And then while this is happening, it cuts to sort of like inner spice, cutting to uh, Hannibal's escape and uh, uh, the the uh, inability, the incompetence of the police force to <laughs> cover, to well, uh, apprehend him. Hold on. I just want to try. This not, that's happens way before. Uh, the interspicing between the scene with J.B. Gump is the police oh, yeah. or FBI raiding. Oh, you're right. The That's house. true. Yeah. Also, so I think there's right, actually sure. a I'll five ten minute yeah. break. You're right about that. Also, I, I like. I'm not. This was unclear to me. Is this is Buffalo Bill actually James Gump or whatever yeah, his name? Yeah, one of his aliases. Or was that just something to throw the cops off the scent? Because clearly, like you saw the picture. That they were looking at, it didn't look like him. It might have been, I guess, but you saw the picture that they were looking at of the guy that they were going to his house, James Gump or Jamie Gump or whatever it was, or Gum, I think it was. Well, I took it as aliases, and maybe he like doctored the picture. You're right about that. It's kind of a subtle point, possible, but I think it's sort of moot in the end. Well, from what I understand at the end, I'm gonna get technical here for it. The FBI used uh, Lecter's. Uh, previous conversation with Clarice Lecter suggested searching for uh, people who want to have gender surgery, mm. and his name so they came checked. Up they ch- no, they checked for people checks. who had a background, and they found a Jamie Gum who. Now that is kind of unclear whether it was a mistaken, whether he just abandoned that house and moved into right. uh, another area. I guess right about that, or, but like I said, it sort of like falls away from the greater point at large. Yeah. yeah. So eventually, uh, Clarice. Uh, as I said, figures out that she's in the house of Buffalo Bill, and uh, a, a quick chase ensues. You know, sort of like the classic sort of tension. Like she goes down to the basement where he keeps his victims, like the famous well, and uh, Catherine is like down there, and she stalks through the darkness, and Buffalo Bill is watching her Great through, through night vision. Yeah, excellently shot. That is, this will come back in, in the style. But they have quick, like a quick sort of dual shootout, and she shoots him four or five times. Maybe empties a clip into him, or empties her six rounds, as yeah. I pointed out. <laughs> Again, technical hair splitting. And then it sort of wraps up. Uh, the case is closed. And then she's promoted to special agent. Has a little like celebration. There's a party. She gets a phone call. Of course, Hannibal is calling her <laughs> of, to, of course it's to congratulate her. And, uh, you know, the famous line. She's like, where are you, Hannibal? Tell me. I'm having an old friend for dinner. And, <laughs> of course, he's stalking uh, Dr. Tilton. It's excellent. Uh, it wraps up. It's sort of like, like I said... It, it reminded me of the usual suspects, even if you subsequently came out later. He just stalks off into the crowd, and you know what's going to happen, and credits roll. 
So again, yeah, uh, he wanders off in his island of Doctor Moreau suit. Yes, and... <laughs> it's it's kind of amazing. Like it should be ridiculous, but like, like this is what Hannibal Lecter would do, and this is what he's doing. So yeah, I mean, again, it wraps up perfectly. It, it's perfectly paced. It's not a single second is wasted. Everything is all there. All narrative closure is complete for all characters for the for the mystery for the murder um, investigation and for Hannibal himself. He's into the wind and he's doing his Hannibal thing. Yeah, and it's perfect. So again, like I, I really can't say much more than that. All right. So this is actually, upon repeat viewings, I feel the weakest section really? of the, or at least the the basement chase scene. Again, I've seen it so many times that I'm interested in the characters. I'm like, there's, it's. But sure. I'm mm-hmm. trying to, but it, if it was my first time watching this, it would probably be a very tense. Scene. It is a riveting. Tense scene. So, a, but upon multiple viewings, like it loses entirely its tension. Here's what I'll say about that. I don't know about entirely, but what go ahead, I. Though. I I thought it was very tense, uh, first of all. But as far as the character development thing goes, I thought this was a really telling scene about Clarice. Because you're watching her. She's like shaking with fear, but refuses to stop going into the house, refuses to stop. Sure. She's on the cusp and, of like yeah, this being entire, afraid. But this entire movie, courage. she looks like she's about to have a nervous breakdown or something, you know, like she's about sure. to and burst even into quickly, tears sorry, sorry to interrupt the, the entire movie. There are certain flashback scenes in which, like, things that's happening in, in the present are reminding her of her past right. and affecting her. It's 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 really clear throughout that she's overcoming, you know, this, you know, difficult life that she's had or, or, or overcoming her own fears sure. the entire time. Mm-hmm. And... Nowhere is it more clear than at the end, and nowhere is it more clear that she's completely unwilling to back down and you know, call up for help or, or you know, run away yep. from that, um, which I thought was a really good closing to her character. Right. It's a perfect arc. I, I wanted to build upon that more uh, because I do like the ending character arc for uh, Clarice, the fact that you not only see her skills as an FBI agent improve over the course, there's a scene early on where she's in like a training center and they fake like they put a gun to her head like oh you didn't check the corner in the basement scene you see her having learned that lesson mm-hmm. and uh doing it professionally and also it's it's the entire FBI is off on in a way of wild goose chase with <laughs> yeah. this yeah but so she is mostly stuck due to Hannibal alone. Lecter <laughs> yeah but she's stuck alone sure in this very dangerous situation and the idea of watching her maturity without having Jack not that she leans much on Jack Crawford but mm-hmm. that it's with kind no of, support whatsoever he's yeah. kind of her mentor there right and all he can do is say when he realizes that they have the wrong house and that Clarice is probably in danger like oh shit. Like Clarice, we got to get back to her. Yeah. So, like, it just, yeah, you're right. Uh, there's absolutely a great narrative closure to her, and her growth throughout this is one of the highlights of this film. Mm-hmm. Sure. I, I just want to make a quick point, like, quickly nitpick you. Like, I see what you mean, like, having been a big fan, having seen this uh, film a number of times as you have, e, that maybe that scene loses tension for you, mm-hmm. but I still think it stands as a perfectly effective scene in in a thriller ish movie of, of such nature. But again, as I mentioned, right? I get, I, I get what you I, mean. Imagine That's this all. was my first time watching this, or I would find this incredibly tense. So I'm trying to view it objectively and not yeah. through the fact that I can quote almost every great <laughs> sure. line from this when it's happening. Sure, absolutely. But like I, I like as we all just said, it's uh, no Carol would approve of all this. And, uh, <laughs> it's excellent narrative closure. It's wrapped up yeah. perfectly I'm in all in all senses, and I will give it a one. Ones, ones, right. ones, ones all around. So I'm on to themes. Here we go. All right. Ready, so I'm ladies and gents. I'm very excited about this <laughs> because I started developing this before I, like earlier on today, before we had watched the movie, based upon my memories of the film. And then it just built up as I was watching the movie <laughs> again. So the, I mean, just to state the obvious first, which this is a heavily psychological film. There's a reason that there's a psychiatrist as the, like, as Hannibal Lecter, as the, the great supporting character in here. There's a reason that you're focusing on Jamie Gum, Buffalo Bill, as a transformative figure, because there's like identity and transformation is almost every single character goes through that hmm. during this uh, movie. Yeah. So it's a great foil. Yeah. I would like to start with uh, Buffalo Bill, which I think is a fascinating name because he is not actually, or according to 
uh, Dr. Lecter not actually interested in being uh, transgendered. He is more so like abused as a child and thinks he, like kind of an escape yes. uh, mentality for it. And the fact is that he wants to cut women up and become a woman while they referenced him as Buffalo Bill, who was a cowboy yeah. and like a very masculine figure. I thought was an interesting dynamic there. Mm, that's a good point. I like it. But and then you have Clarice, of course, who is one of the things I forgot about this. I knew she was objectified throughout this film, but the sheer amount that it's you more have obvious guys than you thought it was, it seems, yeah. like ogling and leering at her throughout this, and all, almost all the like her peers kind of hit on her in a straightforward sure, manner, sexism. but the adult. Yeah. Well, uh, you have you have that scene where they're running, yeah. her and her friend are running, and an entire mass of dudes who are running the opposite yeah. way just turn, turn around, around and, and check her them. out sure you have what? the scene where well, they uh, the bug guys sh- well, yeah I was, should we call it the money shot scene if you will the bug guys oh, oh yeah the, <laughs> oh my god oh yeah that's the most egregious example sure. when a um, deranged lunatic yeah uh, ends up flicking gross uh, matter at her uh, in a very bodily sexual, fluids aimed yeah. at her face yes yeah but but, but sure, like, right. even like the cops who are standing but, around. But all of the adult males that are like should be her father figures throughout this. Whether you're doing at least, Jack no, Crawford, at least respectful colleagues are not yeah, quite well, that. But, but, like, but Jack Crawford is but in a way her mentor. It's brought into doc- question. I think the Jack Crawford thing is brought into question by Lecter, and after that, you view him as a viewer. You view him differently. Yeah, yeah. But which I, I think is kind it, of brilliant. It's a subtle genius of yeah. the film. I, I also think that the last scene when he shakes her hand. Yeah, when he – or when he like – I don't know if it's a, a gr- overly aggressive like sexual chemistry, but I definitely think there was supposed to be an implication there. Mm. You have Dr. Chilton who is overly aggressive with it. You, uh, not that he was a mentor, but he's an, ad- an older adult figure who is taking advantage. And you have Dr. Lecter himself. So it's the idea that she's always treated like this in a sense – not – I want to say a young woman who is not respected in the authority position. Right. And then like – but within uh, one her of the, own field, yeah, one of the great one of the great scenes is when she is with or signed by the sheriffs and mm-hmm. the other cops, and they're all just standing at her and don't really respect her authority. Uh, like well, I think I'm sure, like what's a, why is a woman arguing, uh, ordering us around? Yeah, well, yeah. She asked them to like clear the room, and like yeah. they reluctantly do it, but yeah. they're clearly not happy about it. And and then you yeah. finally see her transform at the end with getting her badge, with facing down upon uh, in a sense a man who preys upon women, yeah. but not sexually in a way. But I think all the other. Like, they Dr. Do ma- Chilton. Well, before you move on from that, they yeah. do mention that at one point where uh, after after that scene after that scene with the sheriff that you just mentioned, where he says, "Sorry," uh, where uh, uh, Crawford says, "Sorry." Yes, I was you going know, yeah, to bring that up if you didn't. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. You know, take you into the room with us. Yeah. It was just for show. And she's like, "It matters. Everything that you say and do matter. Like you know, they matters. look up, they, they you, look up to you. You yeah. define how people treat." Mm-hmm. like women in the yeah, field sure. so that's a very good point uh dr shilton is very interesting with his kind of arc where he's not as good as hannibal lecter and right. he's a position of power over him but still subservient to him yeah there was one funny thing maybe it's come to dialogue or characters but speaking of chilton when uh when he first is t- taking clarice uh to see lecter he says something like, "I think uh, Doctor Lecter views me as his nemesis, whereas Lecter really views him as lesser. Like he's not, he's not <laughs> yeah. equals like at all as an appetizer." Yeah, exactly. Um. I mean, it's really funny. <laughs> but I mean, in all senses, I think that was a, a very like, if not comedic, like perfectly like character little moment there. But like, but, but you're right about everything you just said about uh, how the male characters view Clarice. But Doctor Ch- Chilton wants to transform himself into the Hannibal Lecter, but without the cannibalism. Sure, right, not, exactly. Except he wants he to be the respected cannibal. Listen or, in, or, uh, Hannibal. Yes. Yeah, listen in on what Doctor uh, Lecter has to say, and then uh, Spit pass it, it off out. as his yeah. own work. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, you have but that's uh, Doctor Lecter's fascinating because I think he's the only person in this say, film I'm who. Saying, is has transformed into and embraced that other identity of his now yeah. uh, throughout the full film. If I may, real quick, like yeah. I, I'll, I'll have to somewhat nitpick you disagree. I don't think uh, Hannibal objectifies Clarice. I think he views it sort of a, as a challenge, like not sex, like not like the male versus female thing. He just sees her as like you know a young upcoming. So technically, yeah, he's definitely well, sexually attracted to her. Well, I don't no, know if I even, agree even with if that. even if not, he definitely uses that. Sure, as a weapon, as a weapon against her, and yeah, of that's, course, I agree with that's that. Exactly what it is. But I just don't, you know, he he asks. If, I just don't know if, if this is like be all end all. Goal. When he asks if um, 
she thinks that Crawford wants to fuck her or whatever, if, or if he thinks about that, she's like, that's not interesting to me. In uh, fact, that's something that Miggs, Miggs would, would say. say yeah. Sure. And and he, but he brings it up ag- again, li- like several times. I think every time that they talk, no. he brings up sex. He yeah. definitely does. And but not against. And the right. cor- and the I mean, he wouldn't do that to a guy. <laughs> The caress yeah, you know? of their uh, two two fingers as they're passing sure, of course, what the, is a definite see, I think sign. That, of, I think that more of his of his mind games that he would do anyway. Just consider this, just real quickly, if I may play slightly de- Hannibal's advocate, if you will. I don't want to like. We mentioned this precast. I enjoy Red Dragon as well. His rapport with um, Ed Norton's character in that was sort of the same thing, even though it wasn't like sexually attractive. He was just trying to mess with him, like however he can get to it. And if you recall at the end of that film, uh, it sort of lead into this one since technically it's a prequel. Oh, sorry, you, you clearly want to say something. E. Red Dragon is a fantastic Chianti to pair with the liver that is sounds <laughs> right, like that. Fair enough. Like I said, and I don't, is, I, I don't want to get a, like a we can do an entire tangent. podcast yes. on the. And fair I enough. absolutely disagree with you right. that I think that uh, Edward Norton's character Graham was his last name or Agent Graham. Will Graham. Will, Will Graham. Graham. Yeah. Right. All was right. he? He was the nemesis for Hannibal Lecter right, right. versus Clarice. I will. Uh, I will his go- prote- or who he considers a protege and a. I I think that there is a genuine attraction, especially if you take Hannibal into uh, account. Well, right. if you well, take Hannibal into account, there is definitely an attraction yeah, because well, that right. it was I'll, written I'll, right in. I sort it. of remove. My, I'll sort of go away from. It. All I'm saying is like I don't think there's as much sexualization from Hannibal to Clarice as you think there is. Although I think it's not abs- like totally removed. It's there, yes, but I think it uses it more as a psychological weapon versus an actual like predatory physical thing. But that's all I really want to say about it. Otherwise, I agree with everything you just said. But what else is love other than a psychological weapon? I guess you're right. <laughs> like I won't argue with that either. But the way he uses, it, I suppose, it's like using uh, you know, uh, neutron bombs versus nuclear weapons, <laughs> if, if you will. Sure, it's the best analogy I can say. But I mean, agree with every single theme you just brought up. E. I'm not sure if I have I much have more to one add. One last okay. character to add. And this is also taking Red Dragon and Hannibal into account. Barney, who is the most <laughs> honest character in this film. And I think that's why he survives. He's the hardest working man that. in the same asylums. But, but, the, but the idea is because I I think that he – like you don't really get much of a – I think he became a fan favorite of sorts mm. as it went on. Elevated but, extra. Yeah, but I think that he – the reason he Hannibal Lecter allows him to live is because of – in a sense, not that Barney is a fully fleshed out character – but he is an honest, in a sense, hard, uh, hard worker, and yes, he's a hard working man in yeah. uh, a sense of security. I think that's why. But again, those are all the characters, and I think that they all like flesh out this duality. Aside from Barney, who's just honest. No, I agree with that. I think they all hold up mirrors to each other. Yeah. Was pretty much what you're saying, and um, to various degrees and various subtleties, I absolutely agree with it. It's all handled so well. Um, it's not in your face at all. It's not over the top, but you can see it, and you can see the progression of it throughout. So, I yeah. you got anything else, Steve? Uh, no, I mean, Ian, you covered it pretty well there. Uh, I, was just, I was going to say Barney is like uh, Loomis, basically, from Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But just I mean, always survives. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm giving it a very strong yeah, one. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the strongest ones. Yeah, uh, to yeah give. very much so. Uh, I, I think that they did a great job with that and with themes and... Uh, it's just fun to. Th- it's a fun movie to think about. It, or I don't know. if Fun is the right <laughs> I was going to say, but a, I see what you mean. It's a it, harrowing movie it, to think it's about. It's engaging, you know? though. It's, it remains engaging. I guess I want to say. All right, we're on to antagonist, which I want to ask you a quick question. Sure. Do you think it is the uh, oppressive police uh, force, or is it the oppressive jail system that is the true antagonist of the film? Go. Yeah, uh, Lecter was definitely uh, or, taken advantage of by or neither by the uh, jail system. No, I was. Clearly, it was Buffalo Bill is the antagonist, which is interesting because you don't, he doesn't do much to antagonize the characters other than, I mean, it's it's all like secondhand, other right? Other than be he's, a serial killer. He's killing people. <laughs> sure. I mean, you see what But you that's mean. not, it's that's funny, not but... what's pressing on Clarice or even Crawford. If I may interrupt real quickly, like in a traditional, like a, a different kind of thriller, he'd be like taunting the FBI right. or something, right? Like actively, if you will, yeah, antagonizing. Exactly. Him. Whereas this one, he's just doing his own, like living out his own, performing his own uh, needs and actions. Right. But not like against them per se, but of course they're the law and they're hunting him down. Because they are so driven to, ca- to 
stop these types of things from happen happening, that's where his antagonism mm. comes in. I would also say that there's a countdown feature when the senator's daughter gets kidnapped. Mm, yes, that's true. Th- th- there's Which keeps getting brought uh, up by yes. Elector when he tick, 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 yeah. tick. It becomes an implied and or outright stated ticking clock, yeah. sure, if not literally. But, I mean, you're right about that. Go on. Yeah, there is. I mean, there's not much to say. He's a awesomely perverse, <laughs> twisted <laughs> yes. character sure. who... Despite the fact that he doesn't have a ton of screen time either. And we mentioned this about Lecter is only on screen for 15 minutes in the movie. Buffalo Bill doesn't have all that much screen time either. But I think what the- you see of him is very intriguing, I guess. I like, think- like, strangely, it makes you want to know more. And I think that the film does a really good job of bringing that out, just as the book did. Um, and, and bringing that out in the same way that the book did. Uh, I completely agree, of course. Uh, just let's phrase it this way. His presence is still antagonizing. If not, he is not like literally sure. like straight up antagonizing anyone. His continued existence. Yes. <laughs> his, his his mere, uh, you know, his actions mm-hmm. resonate, if you will. And yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll agree with all of that. So in thrillers, you generally have a focus on like the psychological aspects of the killers. Right. But the fact that they have Hannibal Lecter in this film. Psychoanalyzing him? Well, not only him, <laughs> but you're, you're actually getting quite a bit of Hannah Lecter's personality mm-hmm. through this. Of course. So he becomes, in a sense, the sympathetic villain, where Buffalo Bill almost retains a like feral nature to him. Right. And yep. Yeah, you understand I more about why, but he's never, like, when you, he's never humanized in person. He is right. always kind of this alien figure, but you can do that because you have a human villain because you have in a, a, a charming, uh, yeah, exactly. So charismatic, okay. if you will, yeah, not charming. So I'm giving it a softer one because without a good st- secondary lead such as like uh, a secondary lead such as Hannibal Lecter, you like this character might not work as well. I right. agree. I would say like I, I can see why you would say it's a softer one. I, of course, it's still going to be one at the end of the day. But it would have been less effective and could have been were it not the way it was done the way it was done. I agree. Without Hannibal Lecter, Buffalo Bill is way less effective. Yeah, exactly. Because you don't... So the only humanizing, if you can even call it that, that's done with Buffalo Bill is through Lecter's lectures. <laughs> Which is a new series we're coming out with soon. <laughs> And uh, you know, it's it's through him talking out why Buffalo Bill is the way he is. How, why Buffalo why, Bill why acts, Buffalo the way Bill he acts. acts the way he does? Why he why he? I was just gonna say does the things he does, <laughs> but forget it. But but you know, it, it's it's all about seeing him through that lens. The only other thing that you see of Buffalo Bill is him acting crazy as shit. Sure, and just being a lunatic, and his facial expressions. Yeah, yeah, which is My what he gosh. just said. <laughs> like, uh, being a lunatic. He's like, what's that? Lena's trying to make you what's hear that? his facial expression right now. <laughs> what's that uh, music video you uh, just showed it's, me? It's the Greenskeepers. It's a song called Lotion. If you have definitely never, check if it you out. Have never seen it. It's and composed it had, entirely of scenes from <laughs> Times yeah, of Land, set to the lyrics and song of uh, of the. And of they the, do also. all his best facial yeah, expressions. It's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> But I mean, you're right. So, like, yeah, I, at the end of the day, I think I agree with you guys. Um, it'll it'll be n- not even a soft one, just a softer one compared to everything else. We're probably going to say yeah, about this. I agree. Uh, it, yeah, I think I think it's a decent one, but yeah. only because Hannibal Lecter exists in this movie. Right. Decent slash solid. It one. would be a zero if there was no Hannibal Lecter. Of course. Okay, and Scott, onto protagonists with you. All right, Clarice. I I think yeah. I mean, she's pretty strong. Like you said, she. In any other film, again, it wouldn't have been as subtle and as deftly handled of an arc, right? Mm. Sure, like you've seen like the rookie FBI agent in like a thousand things. Yeah. But you, you can delve, be- again, because of the framework of Hannibal and so forth, you delve into her psychology, into her history, into wh- wh- you know what motivates her, what spurs her, what scares her. And you get like, you sort of like peel away layers of that and you get to identify with this character more and more. A- and as you watch her, like go through the case and track it down and uncover the clues and of course have to be confronted with the killer face to face alone mm-hmm. so yeah i mean i think jody farts does a great job she, she's great amazing in this go ahead i i think that i was going to say that in the same way as the the antagonist without lector she's not as good of a character but i think that's wrong i think that as long as you say the same things that she tells lector 
she is a really good character that has a really good character. Sure, she might, like, without, you, you don't need Lecter to for her right. for those things to come without out. Without Lecter, she won't be playing off as anyone as good, but she'll still be yeah. as strong as she is, I, th- I would say. I love her interactions with Lecter, and this movie would lose a lot, but I think she would still be a strong protagonist without him there. No, I agree. Like She has a great narrative arc, and she's such a believable character as well, and especially from the little hints and stuff. like Again, the, the quick flashbacks and her like fears from childhood or yeah. scenes that remind her of what happened to her. And again, like uh, parsing out information to Lecter in order to get information from him to solve the case that she's been assigned to or, or is now working on. So yeah, I mean, she does a great job, um, top notch. I don't have much more to say. If anybody has to add any more praise, I would, probably. Do you want to say something? I'll just add something at the end, but if you want to say so something. This is, goes back to a little bit of what I was talking about in themes. But the fact that she has to put up with so much sexism, and maybe this is going to sound harsh on her uh, part, but... In a way, her ambition is a very is, is declared in this uh, sure. movie, but she also like for instance, she was sent by Jack Crawford, or it's implied, I think that he sent her specifically because of to, who she is, yeah, because yeah. of fe- a young female sure. for that Hamble Lecter might open up to. But the like the fact that like, she's tough, she proves herself beyond just being like in a sense. Oh, it's it's a very interesting like. And I feel very realistic, especially at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see what you mean. Of what women would probably have to go through to achieve what would a masculine and might role still be, be to this day, just maybe not to yeah. the same extent. But I really love well two things. Now I'll mention actually. Now that you brought that up, and perhaps we should have talked about this a little bit in themes. But I really love that there is absolutely no romance in this. There's no romantic connection. Mm, she doesn't that. kiss anybody at the end. There's none of that. And like. There wasn't even any flirting. That really out. drives yeah. home the, the point uh, of bringing up all this sexism in the, in that world, and like that, you know, she is it's spot on. So I like it. Not only not only uninterested, but unable to even think about that type of stuff because it opens up a whole new can of worms that she, you can't right. fucking deal or with. Like she, it, li- it literally doesn't cross her mind, or if right. it does, she pushes it back immediately, or so it seems. But you're right about that. I, I like that point. And the other thing I wanted to mention was the story about the. Uh, screaming of the lambs, which is still a really chilling and awesome story sure. that is told, and then with the really intense shot of um, Hannibal Lecter and her that thing. is showed, you know, in that w- while that story is being told, I thought that was probably the most affecting scene. Of their discussion. Well, I think that might go to style, but I think it builds her character, of course. And, uh, yeah, and and it also, uh, like, you know, this movie very well, the movie and book very well named because mm-hmm. that discussion between them is really, like, that's something that I keep going back to when I think about this movie. Sure. Is the Screaming of the Lambs. So what are you up to, Silence, Stephen <laughs> Uh You don't want to know. You'll see. You'll never know. All right, so that's the ones all around? Uh, it certainly is. Yeah. Okay, I'm on to supporting characters, which I am going to just do it now. <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> he is... Huge, bloody one written on the wall. Mm-hmm. He informed my life. <laughs> Every time I dine, I think of him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I don't know. He like This movie would not have gotten the accolades it did of without course, absolutely. Uh, Anthony Hopkins' portrayal of this chilling brilliant cultured villain and uh, and it actually going to the point of style the shots of him to really sell the character yeah but you you know about Hannah Lecter you've seen him in other movies so I'm going to pass it along to the others who wish to no I mean I'm you're completely right and I just want to point out something somewhat humorous that pop culturally osmosisly if you will if you say who's the villain of Signs of the Lambs most people are like, oh, Hannibal Lecter, but he's not yeah. the villain of it at all. Right. In fact, like he's the, the number one supporting character and by far and away the best, of course. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Like, we should do an experiment on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, right? it's kind of <laughs> funny. Like That's what people remember about it, but really, he's a consultant. He, again, he's a consigliere of crime yeah. to the FBI. He's like the best serial killer ever who they caught, and he's like, oh, yeah. all these little, all oh, your kids, they don't know what they're doing. I, I want to ask 100 people that question and see what percentage say Buffalo Bill and what percentage say... Uh... Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, so I mean, like that that's kind of interesting and funny, but of course you're right, I agree with you. And even like uh, the other one, the Do- Dr. Chitlin, I think is really good, uh, mm-hmm. like Crawford, of, so forth. Like th- th- those are probably the, the other two like, 
beneath Hannibal Lecter. But I mean, even if they weren't there, even if they didn't do like as good a job as they did, of course Hannibal Lecter is like amazing. Like I don't yeah. know what to say. Like he's this great character, even if of course he's not the villain. He's just there. Yeah. He, he might be the most important side character in m- a number of films ever. Like at least up there, I, for sure. And like like you said, he Hopkins like just absolutely kills it. And the cinematography, as, as we will speak in style, I, I really can't praise it enough. You can add on to. Or I, I mean, I can't say. think of any other supporting character that's as important. Barney. To any film <laughs> as Hannibal Lecter. Oh. <laughs> also, I was going to mention Barney, <laughs> and right. uh, what was it? Tall Cop and uh, sure, <laughs> Shotgun Cop. Whatever they were, friendly psychopath. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever friendly they were, psych- agitated psychopath. Yeah. Friendly psychopath. Whatever they were credited they, as. There were a bunch of strange yeah. credits. First of all, precious. Precious. Yeah. Normally, I would praise the animal or the dog in any film. Uh, it was an okay dog. Whatever. It was an annoying yappy dog. Should we count Catherine as a supporting? She's just victim, you know. Yeah. Whatever though. I mean, she was fine, but what else she could she do but scream I mean, and plead? Yeah. The, the, like, every other character was on Like, we named the important characters right. already. Of course. Know? I mean, even if there were no yeah. other characters As you said, for Crawford yeah. did a really good job. The guy who played uh, Ch- Chilton was, like, creepy. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> Smarmy. Smarmy. Yeah, 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 you're right. You're right. Smarmy. Exactly. But everything's overshadowed by Anthony Hopkins playing of course Hannibal and it deserves the hardest I of ones I believe he got the Oscar for that yeah he did and yes and as well, well, well he should have yeah indeed so I mean I'm gonna give it a one obviously yeah. you have to if you don't I'm gonna eat your liver right. <laughs> why the liver D- dialogue with uh, Stephen Wilson <laughs> speaking the of the scenes between Lecter and Clarice are some of the best like psychological psychologically taught Tense. yes uh dialogue of any movie that's ever been made mm-hmm. i mean just based on those alone you have a easy one in this uh in this topic but as far as the other dialogue went it was good it wasn't amazing Murray but there everything that Hannibal Lecter says is either quote worthy or would be quote worthy if the other uh, if it wasn't overshadowed stuff, yeah, it was overshadowed <laughs> by better stuff yeah like there are lines i forgot about simply because i can't store that many hand lecture lines in my <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. mind but it, it it almost feels like he's too perfect of a character in some senses with his dialogue i i think i joke while watching this that like he must clever. be writing all of these down like <laughs> yeah, well, like while he's sitting like if yeah. I'm in what a else does he have to do? Exactly. Where I have one yeah. cop handcuffed to a thing. What can I say to the other cop? <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's what, like I'm mean, humorously. That's what I said do, while we're watching it. Like, yeah, he's got eight years to think about nothing but his like one his Hannibal one liners, if you will. <laughs> so sure, I mean, but, but yeah, you're right. Like maybe he's, you might think it's like too clever, but no, he he as you said, he's a cultured, educated, high you know uh, brow individual who's also happens to be a serial killer. So. Taking all that together, of course he would be saying this shit like all the time to people, mm. anybody he's interacting with. Yeah. So, and Gum, uh, Jamie Gum is also has a couple of good lines in there as well. Yeah, it's fine. I, I mean, like, like I said, the dialogue is good. It's not the best dialogue I think it's ever. Good, I think it's good to great, great being whenever Hannibal is saying anything. Sure. Yeah. Anything with Hannibal in it is incredible. I uh, think Jodie rest- Fo- Foster's like rejoinders to him were, were fine, like her her attempts to keep up with him and the lines. Well, that's what I'm saying. Any of those given. scenes between her and okay. Hannibal were okay. were incredible. Sure, but they also had some poignant scenes. That you mentioned earlier the idea of what, when uh, Jack Crawford is apologizing for having to yeah. treat her. I mean, that's like, that's a good scene. Like, yeah, it it bounces from being clever to grounded. Uh, I guess I'll it say. grounded and thematic. Mm-hmm. And for that, I appreciate I. Again, there's no cringeworthiness. There's no. Not I wouldn't at even. All. I wouldn't even describe it as workmanlike. I would just say no, that, no, like, no. It's it, good. No, to I think it's dialogue. beyond that. And yeah, like that's yeah. That's what I mean. It's, it's funny. Like if you don't mean to bust my balls, uh, I use that term a lot. I think it's even like the the standard stuff in this movie is ab- above workmanlike. Right. Actually, I will nitpick one part. Okay. Towards the end, the woman in the diner. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, awful actress. Yeah, but she was only on screen for like two minutes. Yeah, but she was. But yeah. if I want to find one nitpick, sure. That's it. But it's, overall, it's, it's funny because I forgot about that scene. Like even even though we just saw it, like I, it like was in and out of my mind until you mentioned it now. But everything else definitely yeah, gets a it, damn solid. I'm giving it a one point. for sure. 
I, I I had forgotten about that until you brought it back up. Exactly. Ian. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Hannibal. <laughs> All right, Scott, under style. All right, I think, I uh, believe this is another very easy question to give a one to. Yeah, cinematography generally was excellent. I ha- I've written under, sort of like Spielberg, Mitch Hitchcock, I would say. is Like you could sort of <laughs> yeah. describe it like, of course, every frame, uh, every scene that Hannibal was, was framed amazingly. Yeah. Even was in darkness and all that. And just like some of the sweeping shots. And like, it, they all, like, I never felt disoriented at all. Like, I felt like right there next to the characters, like when they're having conversations or I'm just seeing them like, interview somebody or go talk to whatever yeah making a phone call whatever is happening on screen is this you're right there so a fly a moth on the wall if you will and yeah it was it was shot excellently uh professionally and knowing exactly what they wanted to do uh perfect cuts like i said like i keep this is the third time i'm gonna say this but yeah when they cut to something there was no reason for there was nothing wasted there, right nobody there was no there's no shot you can be like why was this shot in the film like it it was all perfectly there. It all made sense, and it all was shot lit very well, sort of noir style here and there, like you know the, the night vision scene, as you were saying earlier, Steve-O, looked great. Yeah, I mean, like what can you say? It was it was just beautifully, uh, slickly put together. Now, I want to talk about shots for a second because they did a great judicious use of close-up shots for yes. conversations that were amazing. You brought this up before, uh, but w- during the scene with where they're talking about the silence of the lambs, hardy har. Mm-hmm. They the screaming of the lambs. Yeah, the screaming of the lambs. They keep switching between close-ups and I can imagine how powerful this would be on a, a movie screen mm. of uh cuts between Jodie Foster almost Jodie Foster's almost always at the same uh length from the camera. But they keep getting closer, closer and, and close closer to Hannibal, onto yeah. uh, as if Abbott's he's in face. your face, yeah. yeah. And it right. is moving. And that upon again watching this so many times that is my favorite shot yeah. in the film. The fact that, like, the intense look on his face yeah, and that the it's power so close. of that. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah. So you said film noir. I would say that it was. It, it was a. I'm just saying I'm it took terrible a bit of elements. I'm terrible at the kind of these uh, like panoramic descriptions, but it felt like suburban fall, like <laughs> okay. uh, kind of feeling to it all. Like it, it kind of had a washed out feeling yes. quite a bit, and it had that kind of. Lower middle class to lower class, uh, like suburban feel. Mm-hmm. It, like over again, over that was what the tone they were going for. Like the kind of the sure, culture I mean, where these victims were coming from. As a quick yeah. uh, moment of levity, yeah, they were in like mid, like rural Ohio or more suburban Ohio. That ain't exactly the most pleasant place in the world to be, and <laughs> it sort of like di- reflected that. Uh. Yeah, I had a couple scenes that I wanted to bring up. You guys mentioned a couple of them already. The, the close-up on Hannibal in the Screaming of the Lambs scene. Uh, the night vision scene I thought was really well shot. The intro scene was, if you guys remember, the first shot of the movie is just looking out into the woods. The and Virginia it woods. And comes the down onto the, the fog. Yeah. onto the hill, and then Clarice comes running up that hill. That, that stuck out to me. It was just a really cool mm-hmm. shot, and... Really good way to intro. Um, the shots when Buffalo Bill is looking down the well, mm-hmm. I thought were really interesting. Perspective, I yeah, guess, in the film. Yeah, just a really cool... Sp- and, and that's and that's kind of what I'm building up to, is like they have a lot of like really I'm sorry to say hard angle up or hard angle down yes, shots, exactly, which are really, really force your perspective into yeah, and one way of thing or another. That. There's, a, there's a down shot of when Clarice's... Uh, shimmying into the uh the storage unit uh, underneath the door that you're looking down at her and she like kind of shimmies underneath it which is and and shadow like shot. that's like and it's, that's sort of shadow and it's kind like of thing as i was saying it's like looks like it's just about to start raining and then in the next scene it's raining hmm. so it's like there's a there's a continuity to the feel even the weather and they pay that much attention to where the weather it feels like oh it feels like it's like this scene looks like it's just about to rain Next scene is raining, you know? Yep. Um, and I'll obviously do my thing that I mention every time, which is sound. I thought that the soundtrack was good, well done, understated. It wasn't, it didn't, you know, grab your attention, but it wasn't supposed to. It kind of just it wasn't distracting. made the emotions of every scene. But it, added, it, it added yeah, to the scenes. It, yes. it made the emotions come out more. And 
one other thing that I wanted to mention that I actually mentioned during the movie yeah, no, when I, we were watching I know you're about the sound say. effects. Yep. Whoever was working sound, it's not something that you'll ever notice until you're looking for yep. it. But it was like when you rarely think about when it, they go when into the on. into the victim's throat with the tweezers, and you just hear the clicking and the scraping against the the soft tissue mm. of the inside of her throat, and it's just that perfect sound. It sounds like. It's real. It's visceral. Yeah, sure. And whoever was in charge of making that sound and doing that type of stuff, I mean, it happens throughout the movie, but that's the right. one thing that's, that I really that, remember. Right. Whoever was in charge of making those sounds happen did a really good job. Yeah, so, I, mean, I agree with all of that. It's got to be so a one for me, damn for sure. one. Yes. All right, and I'm on to recommendations. Yes. Next. <laughs> uh, yeah, goddamn see it. Like, if you haven't seen this movie, it's really weird that you haven't. Uh, but if you're like me, if you... Remember from back in the day, just haven't seen it in a while. It's absolutely worth it. Uh, it probably may be better than you remember it. Give it another watch, you know, for the season. Definitely, you know, refresh yourself on how great this goddamn movie is. Yeah, if you're looking for the best psychological thriller in the last 35 years, this is it. And so, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And my, watch it. My final thought is uh, it should be fucking higher up on the AFI list now having seen yeah, it. Yeah, I, I right kind now. of agree with that. Let me ask you guys a question. And I think I know what your answer is going to be, Ian. And... I think I probably know what your answer is going to be, Scott. Right. But I want to start doing this. If we're giving a movie a 10, which this movie is going to be, I want to know, do you guys think if you were just giving it a random score, uh, not random, but if you were if you were giving it an arbitrary score of 1 to 10, would you give it a 10? Probably. If we weren't doing Mots. All right, I mean, just to be... If we weren't doing Mots, if you were just a random okay. reviewer... And it my was, scale was ten, and your scale was one to ten, and you and you were like, and you watch this movie, and you're like, hmm, am I going to give this a ten? Is this a perfect movie? I think I would. Well, I give tens less often than I think the rest of the crew. You do. So, I love this movie, and it's not. And I try to go into every movie objectively. I would give it a nine point five, which I because of a slight little nitpicks here or there. Mm-hmm. But if you want to round that up to a whole number, to an integer, <laughs> a ten, I might okay. actually be the same. I maybe I'll give it a nine, like. But I, 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 again, to, on your arbitrary question scale, it would it's going to be up there. May not be a ten, but it's going to be close. It may actually be a ten. So I, I can't again. I can't think of any flaws in this movie. It's perfectly paced, perfectly acted, perfectly shot, perfectly uh, built up its its mm. own uh, storyline and mystery and. Mm. It follows its murder investigation. And there were scenes that improved over time while other scenes diminished over time. Sure. So it cancels each other out. But it's still one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. I mean, well, here's what I would, uh, to answer my own question, I think I would, I think I would probably give this a 10 uh, just because, as I said, I think it's the best psychological thriller that's come out in the last 35, 40 years. So uh, unless you're going back to, you know, Hitchcock, I don't think you're going to find a better psych thriller than I'd this. I probably one. agree. Best but modern one. I think that Hitchcock would be proud to con- consider Sons of Lambs a part of his rival. Legacy, yeah. Like I agree. Like, I, yeah. I think I think that he would love this movie. Yeah. You know. Um. So that's. I mean, that's why I would. I w- I would say if I had to think about it, that would probably factor in. I think I would give it a ten. Yeah, there are little nitpicks that you can yeah. take here and there, but if you look hard enough at anything, not you enough. can nitpick yeah. something. Yeah. I, sure. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I fully recommend it. Uh, and I'm Jonathan Ian Manser here with Stephen Amosi. Have a good night. And Scott Thurlow. And uh, of course, I'd fuck me. Good night. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed your stay. Masterpiece Theater. Join us again next time, won't you? Masterpiece Theater. Music and editing by Chris Morgan. Masterpiece Theater. Editing and engineering by Stephen Ramos. Masterpiece Theater.